and welcome to our event today. Um, so this event is about non-state actors and sub-national governments in sustainable landscapes, where the rubber hits the road for achieving climate goals. It's about, this is a panel about collaboration and bringing about change on the ground. For that, we take an approach that looks across levels and sectors and focuses on, well, how the rubber hits the road, how these things are in practice. We have five panelists and each plays a particular role in this, uh, in this panel around this topic. We start with a bit of research on multi-sectoral, multi-level governance of land use and land use change. I'll present a bit of an overview, and Thuy will be presenting uh, some of that work from Vietnam. We have two representatives of non-state actors on the panel from private sector and civil society, and we have two representatives of those landscape level actors who are in charge of the jurisdictions or territories where land use actually happens, where land use decisions are made and implemented, um, the subnational governments and in indigenous territories. So across the panelists, we'll be looking at some challenges and some opportunities for, or successes in bringing about real change on the ground. And I'm gonna talk very briefly about research conducted by C4 on multi-level governance and then make a couple comments about the private sector in particular. So for our multi-level governance research, we worked in five countries, in 11 subnational regions, around 54 sites of land use change. We used a comparative nested approach across these sites, across the regions, and across countries, conducted over 700 interviews with people involved in or knowledgeable about a particular land use or land use change. So we had in the end about more or less 20 red sites, we had about 20 deforestation and degradation sites, and we had about 10 sites that were not red, but they were some other way, some other attempt to stop deforestation and degradation. So our goal was to understand through these in-depth in-depth qualitative interviews, how land use decisions are made and the potential of alternatives to business as usual, like RED or conservation initiatives of some sort, to bring about transformational change. We also studied the development of MRV mechanisms in two countries where we were able to examine specific progress on a, on a technical process to see how that was working and, and how it was rolled out. So I'm just very quickly gonna present some key findings. So one of the main findings we had right away was that the cross-sectoral challenges we see at the national level are just as common at the sub-national level. It doesn't matter that the office is next door or across the sidewalk and the, you know, the agriculture's here and forests are over there. We have really just as much problem in terms of working across sectors. We also find challenges across levels of governance. We have different data needs and other interests. We have different interests in the, in the problem. We, see, we have challenges that are technical, they're financial, and they're political. We also have differences or imbalances in power and authority across levels of government. So it's not just different points of view, but also different powers and responsibilities in terms of statutory law. Sometimes we have issues with customary law. And there's a lot of informal uh, realms of power as well that matter in terms of how these decisions are made. We also have different perspectives on the problem, such as drivers of deforestation, and different ways of implementing or not implementing the law to solve those problems. We'll hear a little bit about that in a minute. We also found that even these apparently very technical processes like MRV encounter considerable political problems or really political realities. Not all of these are bad things. So, we also know that achieving serious climate mitigation on, in the agriculture, forest, and land use sector requires major changes in private sector land use practices. One study in seven tropical countries found that four commodities alone, beef, soy, palm oil, and timber, were responsible for 40% of the total deforestation and resulting carbon emissions. This suggests considerable scope for large corporate enterprises to reduce overall rates of deforestation and contribute to more sustainable practices. So how do we track the important voluntary, private sector voluntary commitments that have been made to address deforestation? And is this enough? How do we address the risks that deforestation-free supply chains might further exclude smallholders and other marginalized actors? And aside from the Cancun safeguards, such risks remain largely unrecognized by the UNFCCC. So to close, what I want to emphasize here are just two things. First, we all know we need to collaborate better. In our research and in forums like this, this is 
what we hear over and over again. And we have new important mechanisms for collaboration, such as with the private sector, the New York Declaration on Forests, the Zero Deforestation Commitments, platforms like the Consumer Goods Forum, TFA 2020, the FSC and certification movement, integration of private commitments into the NDCs. But we need to understand the challenges of collaboration, public-private, across sectors, across levels of government, and why it is so difficult to put this into practice. If it were easy, we would be doing it already. We would have been doing it for a long time. Second, we can't ignore political realities. We have many great ideas, but no, how, no matter how great they are, we always bump into reality when we hit the ground and try to start implementing. So in particular in the technical realm, we sometimes see politics as bad or use the term as something negative. But we can't ignore political realities. Politics is not necessarily good or bad, it just is. So we need to embrace this and learn to work in this reality. So I look forward now to what the panelists have to say from their own experiences on these issues to help point us in the right direction. Thank you. So you listen to me? It's okay? Okay, so thank you, Anne. Uh, you really stick to that time, so we are ready. Uh, she, she, she has gave us many arguments to talk, so let's start with a conversation with our panelists. Uh, I just want to let you know that you have two minutes to talk, uh, around two minutes. Uh, if you are really too close to the end, I will use this card. So if you see me doing this, is you have 30 seconds to, to finish. So the first question is to Tui, our research representative, and it is like this. What are the main challenges across different levels of governance that affect land use decisions in Vietnam? And specifically, the approach to shifting cultivation as a driver of deforestation and degradation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, and I could not agree more with Anne Lassen on the point that politics everywhere is a uh, major challenge that we uh, have to aware, but also have to work with in order to have a good policies implementation on the ground. And actually the policy problems, if it had been interpreted very differently, it will also lead to very different implementation and policies preferences and policy option on the ground. And on that one, we want to um, share our research finding um, what that C4 has been doing in Vietnam on multi-level governance. And um, the issue surrounding sitting cultivation uh, sitting cultivation has been always blamed as one of the major drivers of deforestation and degradation in Southeast Asia, but also in Vietnam. But our research findings in Vietnam have shown that uh, sitting cultivation um, is simply a political issue, and there are many different interpretations of the problem associated with different policy preferences and policy options on the ground. For example, at the national level, uh, sitting cultivation is blamed at the drivers of deforestation and degradation and has to be eliminated. But if you come to the provincial level, the provincial government agency seeing the existence of uh, sitting cultivation as the failure to meet their political performance. And therefore, um, it is a, there are many policies on the ground that simply um, do not allow any data collection on uh, sitting cultivation. So if you're looking at the MRV, even though the sitting cultivation is widespread to the countries, the figures is always zeros, and there was no data on sitting cultivation. Uh, when you come to the district level, sitting cultivation is seen as a um, strategic strategies to remain the border um, the national securities, and the district's um, authorities has many policy. Um, on the one hand, try not to report on sitting cultivation. On the other hand, also carry out many incentives to make sure that the indigenous group um, stay in the certain area to maintain the national securities. When you come to the commune level, the issue is further complicated because the commune's government agency seeing city ground invasion is a traditional practice and it has to be respected to avoid any social conflict and to make sure that the indigenous groups are not protesting against the government. So again, um, a different level, different interpretation of the problems and different uh, political interests 
have led to the fact that um, the land use such as um, certain cultivation and the whole group of actors associated with that is invisible, not just only in the MRV system, but also invisible in the policy designs of Red Plus and PES. And the ignorance of this land use type, also the actor associated with this group planning, might also have led um, to the further marginalization of the marginalized group and indigenous group. So just again, the complexities, again, on the politics of number, where the facts and number are selected to serve a certain interest of a certain group, and the complexities of how to understanding them at all the level and try to working on it is something that our research wanted to bring on the table. Thank you very much. Two very important highlights about the role of shifting cultivation in politics, but she said that it's not being too much recognized. So now we are going to change to Bruce Cavarle. Uh, the, the next question is for you. And it's like this. Certification is largely, largely a response to civil society advocacy and consumer expectations that commodities be produced sustainably. In your experience, how have standards set by certification processes come into conflict with public sector land use regulation? Hello, yes, okay. Um, yes, thank you for that. Um, question. And I think that um, what we've seen more recently is how uh, private voluntary uh, certification standards can actually work together with uh, public policy and when you can combine the two to be mutually reinforcing, you have a much bigger impact uh, across a broader landscape than you could possibly achieve by using either one of the two instruments uh, alone. So, um, for example, um, today um, here at the COP in Marrakesh, there's uh, been an announcement and a signing between uh, 10 West and Central African governments who have signed on to something called the Africa Palm Oil Initiatives. And so this is a very interesting development where you see some of the lessons being learned in the palm oil development in uh, largely Southeast Asia, uh, driven by uh, the private sector and some of the challenges that have been faced by private operators, private investors, as well as government agencies trying to regulate that land use. And the uh, Africans have been watching from across the ocean, looking and learning from how that model has evolved. And uh, this is where they've taken kind of the best thinking coming out of the private voluntary arena and have just announced a set of principles that they as governments are going to adopt in order to guide land use decisions as that production area shifts uh, globally uh, and expands out of Southeast Asia into West and Central Africa. So I think looking towards the future and applying the lessons learned, the much more interesting question is how do we get synergies and complementarity between private voluntary certification schemes and government regulations so that they are mutually reinforcing. Thank you very much, Bruce. And next question is for Christoph Tice, our representative from Greenpeace. And it's a large question, so sorry for that. It's this. One of the points that Greenpeace makes on its website about climate change is that the barriers holding us back are purely political. Do you feel the same way about sustainable solutions? Can you tell us what this means to you and what it means in terms of civil society and more specifically in terms of private sector and the government, please? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. So this sounds like a number of questions put in one, um, but I will try my best. 
Um, we are very well aware of uh, major technical challenges when it comes to the land sector. We have to remember that when we look at this sector, it's very different from the industrial sector as we have to deal with both emissions as well as with removals and, and uh, trying to reduce emissions and increase removals, removals and separate uh, f uh, also between anthropogenic and natural emissions and removals because at the end of the day uh, there will be limited financial and other means of support to incentivize the reduction of anthropogenic emissions and the increase uh, through human activities of removals. And that is, of course, technically challenging. But we believe uh, we have um, now major progress we are seeing in monitoring and uh, capacity building. And um, we have seen a lot of initiatives recently. We have seen the New York Declaration, many private sector initiatives, many initiatives driven by uh, uh, donor governments by um, forest countries themselves and still the um, emissions from deforestation and degradation are not going down. So uh, we have to look at the larger political economic landscape and this is why we believe this is crucial. It's, it's uh, uh, to really address the landscape requires political will, largely, and uh, the technical barriers can be overcome. And so we need to really get to uh, accounting rules in this sector that really incentivize emission removals and also incentivize, um, uh, sorry, emission reductions and also incentivize uh, increases of removals that also incentivize adaptation because we have in the landscape sector, we have to really see mitigation and adaptation in an integrated way. And uh, to follow the negotiations here, it's very uh, discouraging to see that there is a constant discussion between either mitigation or adaptation and a big divide usually between developed and developing countries when in fact we need to really see mitigation and adaptation in an integrated way. And uh, we, of course, also uh, need to see clear financial incentives, uh, which uh, have, we haven't, you know, really seen enough of um, finances going into the Green Climate Fund, for instance. And we also believe that um, this UNFCCC process, as well as on a national level, we really need to see uh, strengthening of uh, the rights of indigenous peoples and also traditional uh, users of forest and landscape communities. Again, it's, it is a, polit a political issue and not basically a technical issue. That's why I believe it is a matter to change the political and economic landscape. It is a matter of political will. Thank you very much. A very interesting input about um, what he has highlighted that there are many initiatives, but probably it's not enough. We have to start thinking about more innovative solutions. The next question goes for a representative of the subnational government, uh, Fernando Sampaio, and it's about the Brazil soil moratorium. Actually, the question goes to see what are the opportunities you see for harmonizing the moratorium with public regulations and land use. Well. Thank you. Thank you all for the invitation of being here. Um, well, if, if you think about the moratorium, it's, it's, uh, it's a story of success. I mean, today only 1% of the soya produced in Brazil falls outside the criteria of the moratorium. And just as a sign of how big was this evolution in Brazil, to see uh, Greenpeace members seated with the Brazilian soy industry together celebrating the, the success of the moratorium, I think is a very uh, strong sign of how things evolved in Brazil. But, you know, all these commitments and agreements from the private sector uh, uh, to green the commodity supply chains, I think they are part of the solution. Because the landscape is much uh, more broad than that. I mean, in the landscape, 
we have land land rights issues, we have local communities, we have the, the, the problem of the inclusion of the small holders. And what I'm afraid of is that we are working with clusters of green commodity supply chains where you still have a lot of people outside this process. So how we can work on the politic level to do the inclusion that is needed so these people can participate on this trade, uh, uh, they can uh, work on the restoration goals that we have in Mato Grosso, for example. So we need to create the tools and the instruments to make this happen, you know. Uh, uh, reinforcing the others, and if we are working the landscape as a whole, we are also working to reduce the risk of the trade and the commodity supply chains. And ultimately, we'll probably get to a point where the moratorium is not needed anymore because you have a consolidated landscapes. Uh, so I believe that's the, the, what we are trying to do in Mato Grosso. We are working with the business companies, we are working with the NGOs, and we have set these goals for the production, for uh, uh, the conservation, for the inclusion, and we are, together with the government of Mato Grosso, trying to create these instruments to make these goals happen. Thank you very much. So, of course, the, as you have highlighted, the private sector initiatives are a very important part of the solution, but we also need to include other stakeholders that are being excluded of the process. So, the next question is for our representative of the indigenous territories, um, Norvin. And it's about the challenge that the indigenous territories are facing. Indigenous territories are often not official of national governments, yet indigenous people manage and hold rights to important forested regions, while fighting for self-determination and improving livelihoods. What are the main challenges you face in working with the government and private sector? Debemos de tener los diferentes actores, sector privado, pueblos indígenas y, la, y el Estado. En caso de Honduras es importante reconocer que de Honduras... We have been recognized as our territory has been more than 95% of our uh, indigenous territory has been recognized as collective territory. This is a very important... Um, achievement that we've had as indigenous peoples and thereafter we have been able to influence to, by strengthening the sound todo todo todos los sectores aparte de ello eh, el estadio de Honduras en esta semana casualmente estamos trabajando en unas iniciativas que es la reforma del artículo 45 de la ley forestal que implica para pueblos indígenas. Y de igual manera estamos trabajando e impulsando una normativa indígena donde se vea y se le reconozca en las leyes de Estado lo que es la titularidad que tenemos los pueblos indígenas para el aprovechamiento de nuestros recursos forestales. Eh, más allá también queremos recalcar que las... So we want to say that our political states are the political states really have failed in uh, dealing with the problems that indigenous peoples have in like it's this has failed as something as a cooperative um, there has to be a better strategic strategic way of dealing with the forest that comes directly from the communities the state and the private part have to recognize that the greatest Con qu quantity of forests that exists in the world is really within indigenous territories. So from that moment, from that point, we really have to recognize that indigenous peoples, we are the legitimate owners of our resources 
above and beyond the forest topic. For example, in the Central American uh, map that's been done from the UNCM, the majority of the biodiversity in forests is with, under the management administration of indigenous peoples. They are the owners. They are the ones that are really the guardians of the forests, and we are the ones that live within these territories. So in this case, we have raised the idea that the, the, the political, the private and political state policies, are, we really have to work in a three-dimensional way, in three parts. The legitimate owners, who are us as indigenous peoples, who are part of this, and also the part that has to do with the state, so that they will recognize the d legitimate rights of indigenous peoples. So I want to emphasize here that we we can't just think about the forest. We have to also think about our strategies for the forest and to see the perspective as indigenous peoples, not just that has to do with the commercializing of forests, but really what the forests are giving us, our potential for all the industries and also in the private um, sector like medicinal plants and other factors that have that come from forests and that have to do with climate change. So we feel that we are participants in this broad range and we also want to emphasize on this agenda that there are many factors and we really need to have more political will. That's something that is very lacking. There are s private sectors that have come in to try to pirate, um, use intellectual um, take our property and they are trying to take away our access, but really we need to have effective access to the, the cultural and economic benefits that, of resources that come from our force and our territories. You have mentioned about the land tenure, many of the forest area is in the hands of indigenous territories. So the initiative for you has to start in the people more than in that public sector uh, and the private sector. So we have listened very many of the, um, um, the point of view of different sectors about what are the problems that they are facing in order to achieve climate change goals. Now let's start being a little bit more proactive and finding the solutions. So we are going to start the second round of questions and now is about finding solutions and how to work together across sectors to address climate change on the ground. So again, the first question goes to our research representative, Tui. Um, you told us about this problem of different levels of government with different interpretations of uh, shifting cultivation. How do you think this will be solved? Um, um, it's actually, as everyone is um, independent has mentioned, um, it is not easy to resolve all of the politics and also all of the um, political challenges that we all face at different uh, governance level. But I think that like the solution maybe not um, it's not it's might not easier to find. But um, the importance of harmonizing different policies, interests, and political interests among the actors is extremely important. And also the mechanisms and the accountabilities of the governance structures in place to recognize um, our actor voice, um, a different group actor interests, including indigenous group and private actors, would be um, creating enabling conditions for us to address the problem. Also, um, one of the important thing is uh, what is the problem we are actually talking about? Because maybe, if, um, for example, in the case of student and certain cultivation, it is a real problem. It is the right problem that we're trying to solve to prevent deforestation and degradation. And is this the marginalized and vulnerable group are actually behind the drivers of deforestation? Or is this the last scale and commercial um, let's hold it. So the complexities of um, the landscape, but also um, the need to recognize and also aware of the multiple um, interests from different groups is crucial in the process. Thank you very much. So it's not an easy solution and we have to be aware of the different interests and initiatives. A very difficult um, task for sure. 
Next question goes to Bruce Cavalier. Uh, from your experience, why, where could you see effective collaboration between regulators and certification platforms in fam, framing sustainability standards uh, as you are representative of the private sector, please? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I actually see lots of opportunities, and I actually think we've uh, heard uh, a good case of that from uh, Fernando in Brazil. Um, I think the first thing is to shift our traditional understanding of the relationship between um, uh, public sector uh, regulations and private sector public initiatives. Um, and it's important to remember that those are two parts of an integrated system. You know, historically, that the minimum standards of performance, the floor. Uh, private sector voluntary initiatives have really been more about using the competitive spirit to drive best practices, best in class. That's the ceiling. Um, now, the relationship between the floor and the ceiling is dynamic. And it closes and it grows. And it's dynamic. You never want that dynamic to stop. Um, I think in the case of Brazil, you know, we've seen some really interesting and good examples of how that dynamic works in the soy sector, uh, in the beef sector, where you've had private voluntary certification standards come forth in response to a problem. Governments recognize the problem. Uh, they've gone as far as declaring moratoriums, which is a fairly drastic step for a government to do. Um, but then use those as timeout periods to learn what works, what doesn't work, and then taking the best elements and recycling those back in the government policy, right? And then the system starts all over again. Uh, and that's going to change. We've seen the same thing happening in the forest sector in many countries with the voluntary certification programs around uh, forest and forest management and where government has learned from those and uh, use those to reform regulatory frameworks. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're now beginning to see those lessons being learned across commodity sectors, across countries, and even across continents. So you have the West and Central Africans now looking at the palm oil development experience of Southeast Asia and looking at, okay, well, how can we get ahead of this? from a government land use allocation standpoint. So, you know, the questions of where will the production take place is fundamentally a, a, a government land use allocation decision. Um, historically, those have been very reactive. We've let the market determine where that would happen. And when we've looked back on it, we've said, oops, didn't happen in the right places. The private sector job is about how do we do that? How do we make that production happen as, as best as possible? And when we can bring those two things together, uh, where the production should happen and how it should happen, and do that in a coordinated fashion between the public and private sector, I think that's where we're going to get our uh, biggest uh, impacts, and we can bring the communities into that model and make sure that that's done in a way that there's shared value for the public sector, for the private sector, and for the communities. Thank you very much. So you are suggesting that the interaction between the public and private sector should be closer, and uh, the, the public sector should learn from the lessons of the voluntary certification that you have mentioned coming from the private initiatives. And the next question goes for Christoph Thais, our representative of Greenpeace. Um, what is Greenpeace's strategy for widening the scope of private sector and government commitment to sustainability in their land use practices? 
What has been achieved and what remains to be done? We believe uh, that the private sector is fundamental in uh, achieving sustainable landscapes. Uh, I, I come from a forest background, it's an important part of the landscape. Like our vision would be the private sector uh, buys and sells a lot of products around the world. They're currently trying to move away from deforestation products. Maybe one day we can see reforestation products instead of deforestation products and restoration products instead of degradation products. But in order to do this, we believe the private sector needs nothing more than a level playing field so that they can be really in a market where things are comparable. That means, coming back to my point from before, we need really comparable and transparent accounting rules so that private sector activities are comparable and can result in what I would call a healthy competition across countries. And it is also fundamental that the private sector should never replace uh, the roles and responsibilities of governments. They play a very crucial role in, in supplementing and implementing. But what, where all of this, and this also includes the various interesting jurisdictional uh, uh, proposals that I've, I've been to side events in the first week here uh, on all the different levels uh, from the municipality community to the state to the uh, this is all very very good but at the end of the day this must all sit in very strong and ambitious national contributions the NDCs are absolutely key and we so far are not seeing ambitious national contributions so far. We are not seeing them in developing countries, which I can partly understand because also the finance is not really yet coming. But what is also quite shocking for me as a, someone coming from Europe, from the so-called rich world, that also in, in Europe, in the US, uh, in the temperate and boreal landscapes, we are hardly seeing any ambitious targets for the landscape. Uh, you get the impression here in this conference as if everything that needs to happen in the landscape uh, must happen in developing countries. This is not only ecologically wrong, politically it, this is terrible. Because we, we reckon that about 30 to 40 percent of global landscape mitigation potential is outside of the tropics. The tropic is still fundamental. They must the, the, the biggest opportunities are there, but 30 to 40 percent is not peanuts. These opportunities are sitting in the EU, in the US, in China, in the northern part of this planet. And uh, maybe you have seen something else, but I have hardly seen any ambitious targets from these regions yet. So this is very, very important. Uh, and maybe uh, to finalize, I would, uh, when it comes to the role of the private sector and its interaction with the public sector and the governments, we would strongly caution against offset schemes, uh, where we have seen proposals here in the last week that the aviation sector, instead of reducing its emissions, want to basically buy maybe forest credits or something, which is maybe a fine, you can mobilize money uh, for the forest, but it doesn't help the climate. Because if we want to keep the 1.5 degree window open, every single sector everywhere in the world needs to strongly reduce. And trading carbon is not reducing carbon. So we would really very, very strongly uh, caution against offset schemes to, to, uh, to finance uh, the landscape sector. And also the, the, the second important reason for this is Imagine the aviation sector buys a lot of forest, you know, the forest maybe in the next heat waves goes up in flames. Who pays, you know? Thank you very much. So for sure we have to increase that commitment of all the countries and not only developing countries because climate change passes through the whole world and no developing countries. So I will just, uh, before making the next question, uh, just to remind you that you can write your questions to make for our panelists. Uh, our volunteers are going to pick them up. 
So feel free, uh, and I think the time is now because we just have two more questions. Um, so feel free to send it to me. Uh, the next question goes to Fernando Sampaio from the subnational government. Uh, as a part of subnational government authority in Brazil, what are the main key lessons you have learned towards working for sustainable land use practice with a private sector and civil society? And what are the key messages to other governors on how to move forward? Well, I think uh, uh, the first big lesson that we have is that it's possible to find consensus. This is something that we did in Mato Grosso. We put everybody in the table and we asked the people, what's the landscape that we want for this jurisdiction? So what are the needs that we are going to have for our agriculture production, considering the Brazilian domestic market, the export markets? Uh, uh, what's the, the conservation that we need in these states, the conservation of the water, water sources, the conservation for the indigenous people lands. So we get a consensus on what's the landscape that we want. And we set these goals. We have to reach these goals by 2030 on the production access, on the conservation and on the social inclusion. And people will say, well, this is too ambitious, or this will need a lot of investment, we don't have the money, or it's too difficult, it's too complex. And I think that the, the second biggest lesson is we have to break down those goals. See what we can do. Well, we are talking about 2030, but of course there will be an evolution of these goals during all those years we still have to come. And some of these targets, they are... Uh, easier in some parts of your jurisdiction and they are harder to get in other parts of your jurisdiction. So we have to break down these this, this goals that we have set up and we have to build a roadmap. What are the actions that we have to take to get things done? And we, when we build that roadmap, they will have different responsibilities. Some actions will come from the private sector, some actions will have to come from the public sector. And inside the government, we have different uh, 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 bodies, including the secretaries, the, the, the people that treat the land issues. Uh, there's a lot of different people working in the government. Then they all have to see that they are working on the same strategy to reach that vision, that consensus that was built together with the, the, the civil society and the private sector. So, and we have so much nice experiences going on the ground in Mato Grosso. We have people working on the intensification of livestock. We have people working on the restoration of forests. Uh, uh, we have different commitments from the private sector. Uh, and we have to learn from those experiences, uh, what's working, what's not working, how we can, uh, uh, you know, promote the things that are working. If the problem is, for example, access to credit for the intensification of the livestock production that is critical for the development uh, uh, of the agriculture over pasture, not over the forest. So we have to work to facilitate the, the access to credit, for example. And we are thinking about a de-risking facility together with IDH to, uh, uh, to make access to credit more easier. If we want to the restoration of forests in the landscape, we have to make this economically viable for the farmers. How can we do that? What are the alternatives? And like I said, going on the ground that we can, uh, 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 you know, profit from the results of these experiences. And we have to think about ways of uh, giving value to the huge efforts of these jurisdictions regarding international trade. I heard yesterday from, from people from Unilever that what they are trying to do is that they are buying, trying to buy their commodities from places that are doing the right things. And I think we should think about that on an international trade level, how we can 
bring that to the international trade agenda. That was the speech of my agriculture minister yesterday. There's a huge effort being done in Brazil. There's a huge effort being done in Mato Grosso. How we bring value from international trade to that, to those efforts. Thank you very much. So we have to build consensus uh, by building a roadmap and set responsibilities with all the actors and the sectors, the diverse sectors that we are. So. The next question goes to our indigenous representative, Norvin. Now that the community that you represent has secured rights in land, what plans that it has as a basis to develop forest livelihoods and enterprises? What role do you see the private sector playing as sources of investments and livelihoods? What will your key messages to private sector and the government? In all processes, after we have had gained the title to our territories in our assembly and uh, the territorial governments that we have in indigenous peoples, we have to really construct our plans of life as a vital instrument where each ind indigenous community and peoples will define the route of how they want to have development in their territories. We don't have like a magic wand that this is what we're going to construct, this is what we're going to do. The Mesquito people from Hondur Honduras, we have 12 territorial governments and we have defined that in indigenous in as well as being indigenous peoples, we also have other um, sectors in our communities, and so they have to decide what will be the road, road for development. The involvement of actors is very important in this topic. We have identified that we have to strengthen the um, enterprise initiatives within our territories because we cannot bring something from outside and then they just start to work within our territories. We actually have both the private and the government sectors. They have to recognize how, they have to recognize how that we are an integral part as owners, that we are owners of our territories and the resources. And we have to be participants, not just about benefit sharing. That's also very important, but sometimes the private sector has been fixed more on uh, social benefits, but not an economic benefits, so that they also may reach our territories. For example, within the framework of the Mesoamerican Partnership, now we're talking about what we call the territorial funds as one of the principal Fu fundamental principles that we are the owners and that we are also participants in the economic benefits. And within that same framework, we also have raised and we want to highlight that in the processes where we have a, uh, what we've achieved with the governments, it's very important to have our own cosmovision, our own worldview. We want it this way, and we have shared this with the government. And so we have the certain points which are very important: forest, fisheries, and agricultural development, and also that has to do with a sovereign with food. Um, above and beyond just as an enterprise. So we are very well aware of the fact that we have to feed our stomach, but we have to do this in a very sustainable way because sometimes when we feed our tummy, it's turned into some kind of an agenda of of destroying the resources, justifying uh, the fact that many resources in the forest are being destroyed. So within this context, I believe that the within the private part, they have to work much more closer with the state, the private and the governments. We have to work, work with us in our territories, in indigenous territories. As indigenous peoples, we have said that the external part shouldn't consider us as an enemy, but rather they should consider us as a solution, as a part of this entire comprehensive process. So I want to highlight, to share the worldview that we have always had Many times we don't just consider uh, forests. In the past, we had talked about water, that water would never end. But where are we now? Where are we drinking water from? Water is running out. So we also, if we drink water from outside, we get sick. And the same way we want to, 
We don't want an agenda. We want to be able to use our resources in a sustainable way. As a message that I want to take advantage to share with you here is in many cases, in many countries, the indigenous communities and their leaders, they have been criminalized for defending our resources, our forest resources, for, for defending our natural resources, resources in Honduras. Our sister, Berta Cáceres, who many of you have known about her murder, and this was in the news, and the messages that we have is that we not be criminalized but also, we have to open up to the political will for financing from the state with cooperation and not just to think about an, an agenda of, of extractive industries coming from indigenous territories. That coming from the indigenous communities and the public and the private sector has to see this as um, good action and support them. So. Uh, with this, we finish our second round of questions. Uh, there are many th things that I have been mentioned here, most of them politi uh, many can be polemic, and I'm sure that there can be many reactions between you. Uh, but first, to start a conversation between the panelists, I just want to ask if there are questions from the public. The audience has some. Okay, so we have an open question here. What is the potential and political possibility of using these products um, as timber to replace materials? I'm right with a question. It's okay. I don't know if you listen. It listening good. So feel free to answer the question, please. You're feel free. Well, maybe I can take a start. Um, the, I guess your question relates largely to timber and timber products, um, but it could also, of course, be other uh, biomass products coming from a landscape. Well, we believe there is quite a considerable potential for these materials um, to actually um, replace, uh, uh, you know, steel, aluminum, cement, even fossil fuels, you know, uh, materials which have a very high carbon footprint. And so thus they can indirectly, in our view, considerably contribute to overall fossil fuel emission reductions. But we have to respect ecological limits for these renewable materials. They are renewable, but only if we ex uh, respect the ecosystems they are coming from. And we believe we have often uh, in the name of protecting the climate, uh, seen schemes where, for instance, bioenergy is going up to a maximum where it leads to overlogging of forest and a lot of destruction. So uh, in many parts of Europe, uh, the uh, natural sink is decreasing. Uh, and that is, in our view, not a good climate policy. We need to increase the, our, our natural sinks so that they every year they can take up more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, not less. That's the only chance to really stay within the 1.5 degree target. And that, of course, limits the level of timber or other biomass we can extract every year from our ecosystems. And uh, so this, for instance, timber needs to be used much more efficiently in the future we need to uh, run it in cycles and cascades of products. And then at the end, we should use the energy content for bioenergy. We see a reality where fresh timber, up to 50%, is burned straight away to, to, to make bioenergy. This, in our view, is uh, the most wasteful use of, of a very valuable resource. So we, uh, we must really use as much materials in cycles and cascades first and then use the energy content in the end. Once you've burned it, you can't make a product out of it anymore. Okay, very interesting uh, answer. I'm curious about what is the opinion of the private sector representative about this possibility? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I agree. Uh, 
with what Christoph had to say. And I think that uh, there's, a, there, there's a couple uh, things that, um, that can be done um, and that we need better transparency on in order to, to get the system right. So uh, first of all, um, for the most part, we don't know where materials come from. Uh, so if you have a product and you say, well, where does that come from? The normal answer would be, well, it comes from the supermarket. And so the way in which we kind of uh, produce and trade products, uh, those who use the products have lost touch with where they actually come from. We can't see. The system is blind. There was a very interesting presentation in one of the other sessions earlier today about a new tool, uh, Trace, that just came online. Very, very fascinating. And um, trade historically has been a, block, a black box. You know, things get produced uh, you know, in Brazil and where they wind up in the world is anybody's guess and how they get there, we don't know. So I think to the extent that we can bring transparency into our system so that we can see where things come from uh, is key. Um, the other piece of it too is looking at um, embedded carbon and looking at embedded deforestation. You know, that's, that's another blind spot, right? We haven't been able to see. Uh, and things that we can do that kind of brings transparency into those systems, I think can dramatically change our uh, consumer and producing behavior. But we've got to take things out of the darkness and, and put light onto them. And, and then we can get the accounting rules right. And then you can get the government sector to come in and kind of set the targets right. Uh, and then the private sector can come in and unleash its creativity uh, in order to, to deliver uh, that goal, right? So, so we need to get things that have uh, lower carbon footprints and lower deforestation footprints. And I, I really liked Christoph's earlier comment about, you know, rather than having products that are deforestation free, I mean, why don't we have products that are forest friendly? Why don't we have products that are community friendly? You know, so how do we get systems that focus on the positive attributes of what we want rather than approaches where we're trying to minimizing that which we don't want? I mean, so yeah, we need to set thresholds and whatnot, but to the extent that we can produce things and have systems that accentuate what we want uh, as opposed to what we don't want. So what we do want are things that are forest friendly, and what we do want are things that are forest friendly, and what we do want are things that are community friendly. Problem is right now we can't see any of those. Yes, so timber is just an example, but we can extrapolate this to all climate change goals and the potential solutions, no? So I have another question that I, I would like you to, to explain your point of view, and is what a policy su can support, how, what a policy can do to support and help to promote what we are looking to that is uh, reach, achieve climate, climate change goals, and maybe the sector, the public sector can give us an overview. Uh, so the question is, how can we use the policy? How can we do f from the side of the government to support all these changes and all the tasks that we have to do to reach uh, climate change goals, to achieve them? Um, well, I think government has, has very uh, important tools to mold the landscape. And if we talk about uh, uh, the climate change goals and the EMDCs from the countries, uh, especially in Brazil and Mato Grosso, uh, things like uh, infrastructure, hotel credit, uh, incentives, these are all government policies that can direct the, use, the, the, the land use. So we are just talking about, for example, the, the, the timber, and we have a goal in Mato Grosso to increase the planted forests and to reduce illegal deforestation. And I have there uh, people using biomass for energy, for example. So 
there is a piece of regulation being studied to people give incentive to the timber that comes, the biomass that comes from planted forests. So that way we can increase the use of, of planted forests and we can reduce or make the illegal deforestation less competitive in the biomass market. So I think there is uh, um, a lot of things that the government can do uh, uh, to direct the, 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 the land use. And we just have to align this, those policies with the, with the goals that we have settled and, and, and our commitments to the climate change. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have three more questions uh, from the public, from the audience. Uh, I just want to let you know that for the answers, um, please try to stick to one minute because uh, otherwise we cannot listen to each other enough. Uh, so the first question, which is long because also has a comment, is there is no single perfect solution. There are inherent gaps associated with a purely supply chain approach and unique gaps associated with a purely landscape approach. So the critical question is how we adopt a more holistic and integrated approach that links supply chain interventions with landscape approach to conservation. How do we do this effectively and efficiently? Second question is about Brazil. Who, what, what is the role of subnational government, especially considering that constraints that may be imposed by national governments, for example, in Brazil, with a national government position against carbon offsets, uh, or when the newly elected president in the US believes climate change is a hoax? It's a hoax. And, <laughs> sorry, and to Bruce, specifically. Uh, what do you think about jurisdictional certification? For example, RSPO pilot in central um, Kalimantan. Sorry, I'm not good reading the handwriting. Is this a way to move forward? And so there were three questions. I don't know if somebody Could wants to. First, yeah. Yeah, but try to stick to one minute, please. Yeah. Try to be very... Yeah, okay, I try to, <laughs> to take the first. The first one on, the, you know, really a comprehensive approach to the landscape is very closely related to the policy question. In my view, it really goes back to transparency. We, are, we have to really see the potential of the landscape to, to help to achieve the Paris Agreement, and for that we need full transparency on the current emissions and current removals of the... Of the uh, uh, out of uh, the air, so that we can really incentivize this. And we have to also remember, we do not only have a climate crisis, the world also is facing a biodiversity crisis of a similar magnitude. So we need also biodiversity impact indicators, so that then really every single activity in a jurisdiction uh, uh, from the community municipality up to the to the nation, national level can we can really see how does it affect emissions and removals so we see all too often still perverse national incentives we have nice uh, projects reducing a little bit deforestation and degradation here and there at the same time the same government might promote heavily uh, hydro dams or infrastructure or other, maybe a sustainable level of bioenergy, and then uh, uh, we are all surprised that overall we still don't see a reduction of the problem. So that really needs to stop, that we really disincentivize uh, activities which lead to more emissions and less removals, and we incentivize uh, activities that reduce emissions and increase removals. And that requires full transparency of data. Thank you very much. So maybe next iteration can be from the private sector and a question that has been done to you. Um, yes, so the question, uh, as I see it, is um, about jurisdictional certification uh, and it asks about the specific uh, example of the uh, responsible uh, uh, sustainable palm oil round table uh, in central Kalimantan. Um, so a couple of thoughts. One, I, I think those, I think jurisdictional approaches to uh, sustainable land use and forest management are 
uh, very promising. Um, and the reason for that is because they begin to get the scale that allows you to deal with the um, Achilles heel of uh, project by project, site by site certification, which is leakage, right? So if you do one good thing in one place, how do you know that that's not just displacing the unsustainable uh, behavior that leaks out somewhere else? So uh, the jurisdictional approach is very uh, interesting because it actually allows you to operate at a scale that you can contain this leakage problem. Um, I, and, and so that's very, very positive, very, very interesting, and I think we continue to look to that jurisdictional space for innovative approaches to how you deal with this problem of, of economic leakage, right, which plagues certification systems regardless of what commodity you're, you're dealing with. Um, but then it, it kind of leaves you with the question about certification of what, for whom? Uh, so I think the transparency is still there. I think being able to go from, uh, and to be able to drill down on the origin of products, even within jurisdiction, is going to always be important, this principle of transparency. And, and information. So I think that, you know, that's a, a future evolution looking forward, is as we roll out these jurisdictional approaches, um, how do we keep transparency in the systems so that we can still see where things come from uh, and what the impact are? And if we're opti and what are we optimizing for? Because within jurisdictions, there's a production of lots of things for different people. And so which one of those is the indicator that then optimizes the production of all of the others? Those things still remain challenges. So uh, we're still gonna need traceability beyond the jurisdictional approach. But the jurisdictional approach clearly lets us get the signals right at the right landscape scale level to make a huge difference. Okay, and maybe before passing to the next questions, I wonder if the representative of the indigenous community has any reaction as we are talking about a jurisdictional approach, maybe? It's important that Everything has to be based on the recognition of rights. And in accordance to this, then the processes have to be developed. As indigenous peoples, we have said that if there are no rights, that rights aren't respected, then we cannot advance. That's a, a fundamental principle. The, in all the processes that we have been developing in Mosquitia, it's based on this. And this is what we are continually practicing. It's a rights-based approach. And within this um, jurisdictional approach, some of the dialogues that we have had about RED and the Mosquitia area, I want to just give you a quick example. When RED arrives into our territories, the Secretariat for Natural Resources, um, he, they said, well, look, we're going to give you so much money, they tell us, but then you have to take care of the forest. Don't take anything out of the forest. And the first thing that the community says, well, then we, how are we going to do that? How are we going, are they going to tell us we can't access our own resources and the, re the resources that we get from our forest? So then this whole process that is being carried out, well, we're going to continue having these debates and discussing this, but the, when we take into account the private, the public, the governments, and not just the ownership of indigenous peoples and lo local communities in order to create an agenda together, and that will strengthen the use and the management of our resources, and the use of resources, and not just the topic of, of what comes out of the forest, but of uh, all of our lands, that our rights should be recognize our legitimate rights as indigenous peoples should be recognized and respected. You want to say something about this or we pass to the next question? It's up to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we 
Charlene. Um, yeah. Um, I just want to. Um, I just want to comment a little bit on the incentive structure that need to be in place to driving the behavioural change of the private uh, sector that some of you mentioned. But I think that one of the results from our research finding in most of the red countries under the global comparative study, the incentive uh, is just not enough, but it also they, there is a need to have a government structures in place to monitor the accountabilities of this commitment to what, um, you know, uh, climate change and um, policy action at the country's level. So incentive on the one hand, but also as you said, the transparencies and also the system in place to make sure that you know the accountability is in place and the commitment that made from different se uh, sectors and different actors is actually was implemented on the ground. So transparency and accountability as a key thing to start going to achieve the climate change goals. Uh, just the last question. Now the floor is all yours with your question, please. Well, no. Yeah, it's working. Um, well, I think the question was more about the sometimes existing conflicts between regulations from federal governments, from jurisdictions, states or municipalities and how we can solve that. And there's obviously not a clear answer on that because every issue will be different. We are talking about uh, uh, sometimes you have dozens of different government bodies that interfere in the landscape on the agriculture production, on the conservation, and we have to put all these people work together. Um, but. The idea, I guess, is, like I said, if we establish a vision, what is the landscape we want for our jurisdiction, and we know that this vision is aligned with the commitments that Brazil has made, so we are basically working on the same side. So we have to understand each other and to see what there are the changes that we need to make uh, uh, in order to advance this, these goals. Uh, the, what was uh, given here on the questions is that, for example, the Mato Grosso state has a red plus policy uh, and the federal government in Brazil has a different understanding and there's no way, I mean, we have, we'll have to sit together at some point to decide what's best uh, uh, for the jurisdiction, for the country. And but I'm sure they have to consider what the local people are doing and what we are, what we want to achieve. It has been difficult to do this coordination. Has it been successful again? Uh, well, at the end, uh, it will always depend on the people that is occupying these key positions. But um, there is a. Uh, uh, a lot of goodwill in uh, making these good things happen. Okay, thank you very much for all your answers. Now we are going to see a case study uh, with a video that I, I mentioned. Uh, it's five minutes video, so let's go to see. Can the video being shown also in the screen we have here so the panelists can also see?
Sorry for the problems, we are trying to solve it. Just a minute, please, for the video. So in the meantime that we are trying to fix the video, uh, I would like to ask you a last question. Normally this goes after the video, but we keep on going. <laughs> so we have here the audience. We, we have been talking about many things. What could be the key message that you want to give them about what we were discussing from the point of view of the sector you are representing? We can start with two. Um, I just want to highlight the two key measures from CIPA research that Aileen just mentioned earlier um, in our section. The first one is really about the politics and also the politics, the fact that politics is everywhere and we cannot avoid it. And it is very important to learn how to work with this, to make the policies working on the ground. And the second key message that we wanted to highlight, it is very important to understanding how the problem is framed by different actors um, and uh, what is that, their interest in framing the problems, but also try to um, understand what are the key problems and, and the real problems that are do that and we are doing that we are now starting to measure in that uh, but I think the other message is that we have to find better ways to bring value to what's been done we have to give value to the huge efforts of the farmers of uh, 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 the conservation that has been done on those jurisdictions on the on the on the trade side on the carbon uh, so we have to help the people that are trying to do the right thing on all levels and that is something that we still have to go uh, deeper in that discussion.
in many of the processes in order to have achievement, to have success, in order to have maybe not 100% success, it really includes having good faith. We need to have political will on the part of the states. Without political will, we cannot advance with any of these initiatives. And we, we have to have an agenda, an horizontal agenda, not a ver vertical agenda at the, round, at the table when we are discussing these t topics. Those of us in Honduras, we are progressing with a consultation law as an, a legal instrument in order to strengthen the rights of indigenous peoples. So we have said, we want this to be discussed. We want this law of consultation to be discussed. We've had these consultations, but not an agenda that has been used in the past. We, it's not like we have to take a certain uh, formula to the communities. We have to construct this together, not just have already a set formula that's been used in the past, and to include indigenous peoples and not to consider them as indigenous peoples as enemies of the development agenda. Many people have said that we're enemies of the process of development. Rather, we are a fundamental part of the development in many countries in the agenda development agenda that's being implemented. As I said, we're not enemies. We want to be a part of all the initiatives, but only when and if our rights are respected as indigenous peoples and the rights of our territories. The message I guess I'd like to leave with the audience is that there are uh, practical steps that we can take. Hello? No? Is this better? Yes? Okay. Um, so the parting message I would leave is that uh, we believe that there are practical steps that we can take now uh, to bring together uh, public sector, private sector, and communities to build models of shared benefits uh, and also shared risks. And if we can find uh, and promote good examples of how we do that very, very practically, uh, particularly if we can do that within the context of these jurisdictional approaches of where they're trying to get the policies and signals right, we can not only uh, tap into uh, investment, and use investment to drive uh, climate-friendly, forest-friendly, people-friendly outcomes. Uh, but we'll be able to transform the investment in the capital that's already out there. And the key to building that new future will be putting together these partnerships. Uh, so uh, the public sector can't do it alone. Uh, the private sector cannot do it alone. Uh, the communities cannot do it alone. But together, we can achieve impact and potential that otherwise wouldn't be achievable. Key message is um, to recognize the fundamental role that landscapes have forests and other landscapes to not only achieving the 1.5 degree target of the Paris Agreement, but also the targets to, for adaptation to climate change, to promote and help to achieve the sustainable development goals and preserve biodiversity for the benefit of the local people, of civil society in general, governments, private sector, and then, you know, all the, the means can be listed, like uh, I totally support what has been said before, the, the, the crucial role of uh, uh, respecting and uh, indeed supporting indigenous and local people's rights, uh, getting the rules right and transparency, and then finally have uh, uh, 
clearly the right incentives and, and adequate uh, uh, financing and other support which has to crucially come from the industrialized countries. Thank you very much for all your inputs. So in the way to achieve the climate change goals, there are many things to think. No? We are looking for benefits, but there are many risks. And as you have pointed out, we have to share both. We have to share the benefits, but also be aware of the risk and also be willing to share these risks and reduce them. So we are facing many challenges and I hope that we all have received many inputs that can be helpful for the work we are doing currently. So now the video is working, so we are going to play it and I hope everybody enjoys. are meeting development goals and reducing poverty. Everyone needs to work together, governments and the private sector, with the support of civil society. The drivers of deforestation vary from palm oil in Indonesia to beef and soy in Brazil, but there's a lot tropical countries can learn from each other. Brazil reduced annual deforestation in the Amazon by 77% in seven years, since 2011, it's stabilized at 5,000 square kilometers per year. How do they do it? Better satellite monitoring of illegal logging, strict enforcement of the laws, a moratorium on soy expansion into forest lands, and public-private collaboration to promote sustainable beef production. About 60% of deforested land in the Brazilian Amazon is now pasture. 20% of the cattle herds on that land belong to smallholders. According to law, producers are meant to set aside some of their land as forest. That wasn't always happening until the private sector stepped up. In 2009, supermarkets began to suspend contracts with suppliers linked to Amazon deforestation. Parts of the beef industry pressured landholders to comply with environmental laws by only buying certified legal beef. So large numbers of landholders signed voluntary commitments to protect or restore their forest in alignment with the new forest code. And the fact is that these sectors are very concentrated to a small number of large scale companies that made the commitment to move in that direction to help so on. These public-private interactions are, are one of the key to, to understand the success in the Brazil case. The challenge for Brazil now is to produce more and better quality beef on less land without increasing reliance on chemical fertilizers and herbicides. That is possible with the right incentives, but they need to target rural farmers, not just big companies. Reducing deforestation in primary forests, improving livelihoods for smallholders, and expanding supply to meet a growing demand. Each of these challenges affects the others. Wicked problems need complex solutions. Solutions that will only be found if governments, the private sector, and civil society work together to meet these interconnected challenges. So just to end this session, this was a good example of how can we harmonize different sectors. Uh, now we face the challenge to do it in all the areas we are working on. I just want to thank C4 for organizing this session. Thanks to all the panelists for all the interesting inputs. And thank you very much all for coming here to listen to us.